I'm happy to see that everything is more or less working right now. I say that right now because that could change at a moment's notice. <laughs> everything stops working. All right, I'm going to take over the screen for just a second while we um, while we introduce the, the, the YouTube people. And I'm going to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, this is the virtual pipe club for October 17th. I uh, got a lot of really great people here today and um, a very special guest. Um, and um, I'm encouraging everybody over there on YouTube to remember that you are just as much a part of the uh, virtual pipe club as the people who are in the Zoom room. So welcome. If you have questions for our guests or if you have things that you want to share or talk about um, um, what you're smoking today and just interact with each other, then um, please be my guest. And I will try to bring your questions into, um, into the guest here. Got Moog Father 678 is already there. Jeannie B is there. From Memphis, Tennessee. That's awesome. Um, so welcome. And now I'm going to uh, unspot myself. And here's all you need to know about that. Once I've done that, get rid of my mug by just clicking on gallery view again, or speaker view, and I will disappear. And, uh, and it'll be a much more pleasant landscape, I'm, I'm sure. So yeah, if you're on a um, you're on a mobile device, cell phone or, or tablet or something like that. Remember that you can change who you see by just doing a finger swipe through there. So just go ahead and, and swipe your finger and you can get to different people in the group. And, uh, and that's how that works. Um, groovy. What's my weed of choice today? There, there's... That's an interesting way of saying that question. <laughs> Actually, I, I, I'm going to be changing here in a second. I'm just finishing up a cigar. I haven't smoked a cigar forever. And um, I just thought I would, I would do that this morning. Had a little break in between my last half and this. But um, so I'm going to dip into. By the way, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been here before when I sort of showed the whole, um, the whole studio setup that I'm in right here. Um, it took down one camera, but I want, want to show you, I cleaned the whole space out. Look how clean that is. There's no more pipe cabinets or anything. So I actually have to go into another room to get all my pipe stuff. David, no. we have, we have, uh, we have some back noises, so maybe you can shut off of the mic for I am, now. Yes, I'll do that. So, um, friends and neighbors, here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put everybody on mute, but don't take it personally. So it doesn't mean that you can't um, turn your mics back on any time at all to, um, to ask questions or to, you know, just chat. Uh, I'm only here to try to keep the momentum going, but as far as controlling anything that's going on in the club meeting, it's your club. It's your, your, uh, your time together. So uh, the purpose of putting on the mute button is like Oliver said, uh, just background noise. Like you're sitting there and you're totally chill and then all of a sudden the next door neighbor's lawnmower comes by, it'll take over the screen and, and, and just kind of sometimes is a little annoying. But um, other than that, that's the only, that's the only reason for that. So um, uh, chat amongst yourselves for a moment while I go fill up a pipe. What am I going to smoke today? I'll tell you what I'm smoking today. I'm working on a review of Squadron Leader. I know, right? I, I got this hat just so I could do the review, and I didn't realize that it was probably going to be too big for myself. So I'm going to have to do some, something about that when I do the review. But uh, that's what I'm going to be smoking today. A little squadron leader. 
I thought it was from the YMCA people. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's another that's another whole episode. <laughs> I'll take my shirt off or something. I don't think that's not a good look for me anymore. You know. Yeah. No, David's like we don't want to see that, bro. Um. So uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, David, why don't you uh, why don't you kick it off? To t- uh, tell everybody what you're smoking. And. Um, uh, and actually, I I responded to your text earlier. Um, the Drew Gatsby. It's uh, 2013, I believe. Um, and I kept in the team because from what I see the review, uh, reviews before, it has a little bit of topping. So I get rid of that and it's all gone. And it's just like a citrus, hay, kind of grassy with a touch of honey, uh, Virginia. And what is surprising is that I smoked it years ago, but it used to be the normal flake. When I opened this one, it was like ugh, this long flake, just folded one on top of the other. But it's really, really good. Those, those were like massive. Mm. In case you guys haven't haven't seen that, David put up a, a post on the, on our virtual pipe club group um, showing um, the, these flakes that he was smoking. This is the, the this is the Samuel Gawith flakes. No, it's a Drew from the tobacco I mean, cigar company. It's oh Drew no Estate. Longer. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No longer. It's yeah. It's a. I don't know if you can see it. It's from the Drew. And they don't make uh, pipe pipe tobacco anymore. And it used to be kind of like let me get it here. It used to be like this wide long. Once I just I just chop it and and divide it in three pieces. But um, if you put them together, it used to be this long. So I just separate. I just separate it in two pieces. Awesome. Who else? Who else has got something? Ruby okay. in there. This Freeberg, teeny tiny Freeberg. Excellent. Zach, what do you smoke? Zach, you've got a giant. Uh, machine there. Yeah, it's a uh, a newt, a Knut Carl Eric Danish freehand. I got it a couple weeks ago at uh, an antique store for a ridiculous fair price. And it's got some, and it's hard, no bad lighting in here, but the grain's pretty awesome. Um, and I have some GLP spark plug. Nice. Hey, while we're talking about this, um, just to put a bug in everybody's ear. So we have a speaker today. We have a speaker next week. And then the following weekend is Halloween, uh, the Halloween weekend. And some of you guys may have family that you're going to be doing some Halloween-ish with uh, or whatever. But I thought if we went ahead and had a pipe club meeting, we could do a theme on the meeting about your strangest pipes. And I've been sort of throwing out some um, curiosities onto the uh, Facebook page about your favorite Halloween, people's favorite Halloween tobacco and um, gotten some really interesting, somebody came up with um, haunted pirate ship, which is a blend of haunted bookshop and pirate cake. Whoa. Which I thought, now that's interesting. I'm going to have to try that. I have to, to, so, so I don't know. That's just an idea. Maybe we can chat about that a little bit later in the, in the meeting today, but that's my thought for, for um, Halloween. Mm-hmm. And then we have uh, guest speakers um, right after that, the following uh, Saturday. And, and um, I'll tell you all about them in a little bit there. You could also go with pirate bookshop. Pirate bookshop. Yes. But all the titles have to begin with, our <laughs> our pirate bookshop our pirate bookshop i know alistair's going i don't believe he really said that i really don't believe <laughs> <laughs> um dimitri what are you smoking today my friend well smoking one of my blends in this uh, for that sassini 
Nice. Which blend is it today? Uh, different orientals and uh, uh, Indonesian Sumatra Seco. And I have my friend here with me. She's keeping me company again. Oh. Zach, I'm I'm using one of my 320s. Hard to beat. Hard to beat it. It's it's that time of year. I thought I'd bust them out. Yeah. Did you guys see the uh, Chaco Mapless that I posted up earlier on on the week? It's only just arrived in the post here. I need to go and collect it, but that has got one of the nicest uh, sort of uh, pipe designs in terms of color that I think I've seen in a pipe. It even beats my uh, Homeland Petersons here. <laughs> I missed the first part of that. Um, where did you see it? I was uh, up on the virtual pipe club page there maybe a couple of days ago, I think, when I first spotted it on eBay, but it's arrived already here. I should really go and grab it for you guys uh, later on. It's got one of the most uh, intriguing looking patterns that even seems to run all the way up the stem with the sort of uh, old uh, turquoise sort of uh, color that goes to it. It's absolutely beautiful and I'm kind of hesitant to smoke it and ruin it. <laughs> Unbelievable. Some of the things that... Um... I'm starting to see just when I thought that I had um, seen the breadth of, of color and design. It's like, I, I see a brand new one that I've never seen before. It's just, it's just endlessly fascinating. I, uh, oh, no. oh, I, I sure saw one that was like sort of a cross between a carburetor pipe and a, and a, um, and a hookah. So it's a, it's small. But it basically it sits on a stand on the table, and then you tube it in. And I thought that's really creative. Like people are getting majorly creative there. Speaking of creative, wild. Oliver, what's happening? Yeah. You want to give us an update on our club pipe? Yeah. Uh, so we have uh, pretty much eighty orders in so far, and uh, right now we ordered hundred in total. So 30 with filters and 70 uh, without a filter. So, and I will close the order process when we pretty much sold out. So to make sure that everybody gets the pipe he ordered and uh, yeah. Maybe we have a chance to get the pipe this year, maybe before Christmas, but we will see. So we work on it. But it works per perfect right now. So I have a, a long conversation all the time with Chris. So we work hand in hand and uh, it's very smooth. So it's good. I think you've done a fantastic job, Oliver, man. That's really been awesome. Has, has, has everybody ordered one? Yep. Yep. I got mine. Yep. Even I though ordered. it's not the oh, bulldog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also I want the bulldog. But yes, I hope second. Uh, a uh, club pipe will be Ben Bulldog. <laughs> yeah, so maybe, maybe, it. With a, maybe with a different brand. So otherwise, it's a little bit too boring all the time. The, the bone pipes. He, yeah, he just relisted a whole bunch of inventory on his page too, though. Yeah. So if you're looking for something specific, go look now. Yeah, I'm buying one regardless. So. Yeah. Is there still an opportunity to to get a hold of one of those? I I haven't had a chance to buy one yet. Yeah, Tyler, we still got about 20 left. Okay. Uh, who do I talk to about, or where do I go to get that? Um, Oliver, you want to tell them where to look? So, yeah, we have uh, we have a special post uh, on, our, on our Facebook uh, page. So go on this uh, special post and you see all the details uh, to order one. So only uh, you have to pay it with PayPal, PayPal only. And after you, you paid, uh, you have to wait until end of the year to end the process with the shipping and all this stuff. So the, the price is 39 bucks and plus shipping in, in the US is uh, eight bucks and uh, international would be 36. So it's not cheap, but it is what it is and we don't have it in our hands. Yeah. If you're in the US here, the pipe is, is about $45. If you're, 
you know, anywhere else, it's 900 pounds. <laughs> Close to it. <laughs> It's a little bit more. Yeah. Um, Tyler, if you go onto the Facebook group page and you can't find it, look under announcements. So there'd be a little tab for announcements. And then all those special posts that Oliver's made about the, the, um, the pipe club pipe and the, um, the exchange. Um, what do we call that? The Trade, trading post, trading post, all that kind of stuff is under the announcements parts. And so sometimes if, if the post gets buried, um, you can still just go find it there. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Here, here's my, here's my latest. Brian Orton. Beautiful. What are you smoking Lowell? Uh, pirate cake. Pirate cake. Our, <laughs> yeah, I'm lucky to get this in, in case, you know, none of you heard of Brian Orton and the fire he had. He lost his shop. And uh, he's got a, uh, what do you call it? You, he's got a fund me page up right now and he's taking donations to help him get his shop back up. But I, I got this about... Mm, Two weeks ago, right before, right before he had his fire, so I was lucky to get it. Where's he? Where's he located? He's in. Uh, I think he's in Vermont. Wow. So he does Oregon, didn't it? Well, uh, maybe you can post link on our Facebook so those of uh, us who can afford can make a donation. Yeah, to totally. We'll we'll go find that and put it up there on the on the page. Yeah, he, he made me one pipe and sent it to me and it was too small. So he said, I'll make you another one bigger. So he did that for me and that was really nice. So I sent that one back and this one just came a couple weeks ago. It's really nice. It does really unique too. The uh, stem is, is rough. He, uh, carves, he carves out the stem. So that's taken a little getting used to, but it's, it's nice. You don't What's have to worry about teeth marks because they already got them in. <laughs> I messed your wee pipe there. Could I see it again there? Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Is that a blue tent on it or is it what's showing yeah. up on my... Blue. Blue, uh, is here. blue is my color because I'm from St. Louis. Blue is that, my... There's that one there I was saying about. I don't know if you can even see it in this oh, light. Yeah, I, I saw that one. I really like that a lot. And it a is nut. a lot. I, 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 I love stems. I, I'm a nut for fancy stems. Most of mine have colored stems or some kind of fancy stem. Yeah, this one really doesn't sit well on the pipe rack. All the rest of them are sort of uh, natural colors, all sort of dark wood and uh, ebony and whatnot. And then there's just this bright, uh, I don't even know how you would describe it. Marble. <laughs> oh, I finally bought me a new lighter too. Welcome to the Tall Boy Club. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a Caribbean. Yeah, that's a Caribbean, I was going to ask you. Caribbean or something like that, but it's really nice. I still want to get that one that Dimitri has. That's uh, such a badass looking lighter there. Very, very high tech. Yes, I, I posted a link on a Facebook, so they're available for sale now. Oh, yeah, I saw them. I, I almost got one of those. It's pretty neat. Yeah, I think for Turkey Dallas, it's a really good deal. And for sure. Um, is anybody uh, a newcomer today? First timer or newbies? Hey, Ray? Nice to see you, sir. Gabby. Thank you. Thanks for the welcome. Yeah, nice to um, meet some some new folks and um, hope you uh, come back um, often. Don't don't be put off by, you know, Oliver's uh, continuous F bombs that he that he lets go. <laughs> oh, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> We're adults. Oliver, I, I'm kidding. He is a, he is a gentleman through and through. I um, no. I keep trying to get him to to let loose, but he's very okay, very genteel. No, it's good to to meet some new people and and uh, um, keep the 
keep the, the blood flowing here. Oh my gosh, look, there's like, I just looked over at our, at our um, YouTube page. There's a ton of people. Bill McCullough is over there on YouTube. Bill, you don't like us anymore. You have to go over there on YouTube and <laughs> um, GD Oot in the boot is says howdy from the Scottish borders. Um, Yuriki says he'll try to come into the zoom room later uh, up there in Finland. I know it's late up there, isn't it, bro? It's very late. Uh, Bill McCullough says he's smoking Elizabethan mixture in a Jorgen Nielsen Dublin. Interesting. I love my Dublins. Uh, WKR Piper in Cincinnati says he's got some squadron leader special edition with Perique. Yeah, that's going to have a bit of a kick to it. I'm, uh, I'm thinking. Um, who else smokes squadron leader? Once in a while. Yeah. Would you say this is light, medium, or heavy in terms of nicotine? I would say medium, maybe, because, uh, you know, after you've smoked that, uh, the Kentucky McBaron mix, everything's medium afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I kind of, I kind of agree with you. Yeah, I think it's medium. The, the stronger, and it's not really strong in nicotine. It should be the other, uh, the other one they have for their. Um, I forgot the name now. Um, never mind. I'll, I'll think about it in a second. The Commonwealth. Sorry. My brain was yeah, the squadron leader has some spice, but it's not heavy on nicotine. I'm always trying, I'm still, after all this time, trying to calibrate my own taste buds, you know, like what what I would consider to be strong. And then I read somebody else's review and it's like, oh, this is really um, over the top or something. Like actually well, I think is you cannot really taste nicotine. Uh, you sometimes when it's a lot of nicotine, you can feel uh, when it kicks in, but you cannot taste it. So very often it's hard to tell if it's uh, heavy on nicotine or not. Right. Uh, because uh, I can give you one example: a cigar, a Partagas Black Label. It has uh, Nicaraguan ligero, it has Dominican ligero, and it has uh, Connecticut Broadleaf Medio Tiempo wrapper. So it's really heavy on nicotine but it's so well balanced and it's so smooth you don't feel how strong it is until you stand up <laughs> yeah well if uh, if you uh, smoke like six by 60 on empty stomach you'll feel it by the end of the cigar <laughs> nicotine will hit you in the head but you don't feel how strong it is by taste it's just so smooth and well balanced uh, John um, put the link to uh, the Orton Donation Fund on the on the chat box. I'm going to copy it and put it on our um, our Facebook group. John, thank you for doing that. Um, where is that? Where am I going to go here? Um, so David, I have a question to the tin of a squadron leader you uh, check out. Is that a fresh one? It is. From Everything hard. So is uh, the tobacco um, a thinner? Are the slices thinner? And uh, it's uh, is it as uh, as wet as it was in uh, the production of uh, Samuel Gavith? So this is the Samuel Gavith um, tin, and it's it's rubbed out. It's it's um, not any flakes in there. There's a couple of chunks in there kind of thing that, but it actually, I would say it arrived in just about perfect uh, dryness. So it was, it didn't need to dry out at all. Um, that was always a problem for me with the Gavith tobaccos. And I think I have uh, heard something about um, after the change of the production that they are getting uh, the tobacco uh, way drier than, than they used to. So maybe it's time that I uh, can uh, try some tobaccos. I had one time the 
round number four, and that, that, that was too thick and too wet. Yeah. So I think they uh, uh, had to keep the Lakelands uh, drier uh, in another way. <laughs> and this one, um, I don't know whether they just let it sit out for a while before they packaged it up or whatever, but it, it, it came in um, very nice. Um, some of the other stuff that I got uh, along with this order was a little wetter, though. That's for sure. I think you can't have a, a, a relight phobia if you're going to smoke Sam, Samuel Galwell's tobacco. So it's just they require a few relight, relights. Yeah. I, but you just I dry mean, them out for weeks. I mean, that's which I don't. Life's too normally, short. Normally what I do with that is just open the tin. Let's say you smoke something else that afternoon or evening. Yeah. Dump yeah. it on top of the table, the complete tin, and leave it overnight. And the next morning, mm -hmm. before you go work. to work, perfect. That should work. So you don't have to wait every single time you get a flake, having to wait an hour or something. Just do it overnight one time, and by the next morning, it's perfect. Has, has anybody on here ever tried the wrap it in a paper towel and stick it in the microwave for two seconds? No, no. Okay. <laughs> I've, I've heard it, but I, I, I've been afraid to try it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm not going to try it. You try it. <laughs> no, wood burning stove though. Um, if you wrap it in a bit of what you're saying uh, in a paper towel, set it on the wood burning stove when it's at its highest for only about 15, 20 seconds and take it off. It's almost perfect. <laughs> And that's why we have these club meetings to find out all these little, these little things that nobody ever tells you. Yeah, Rob Rob Bowden bought a, a tin of um, uh, it's an old fashioned bacon something or other. I'm not even sure who it's by. And we opened it up, and it was so wet we couldn't even keep it lit. So, Is, did it come in the jar? Yes. Yes. Um, who is that? Oh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Um, not Country Squire, but uh, Briarworks. Briarworks, yes. Briarworks, yeah. I mean, and it, it took a little bit by the end of the by the end of the smoke, it was kind of growing on us. But the first part of it was like, I'm not so sure about this one. But by the end of it, we're like, yeah, this isn't too bad. I have a I have a, <clears throat> a jar of their um, sweet tea. I bought it when I was you know back smoking a lot of aromatics, and so I I bought the sweet tea thinking that it would be sweet. <laughs> it was just wet. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of the Peterson's tobaccos, actually. They're really, really nice tastes of them when you let them dry out a wee bit. But see, when you first open their arom aromatics, it's, uh, it's just constantly burning hot on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Our, only Peterson uh, I really enjoy is uh, three piece Peterson Surface Plug. It's uh, just uh, slice it. Some people uh, cube cut it, but uh, when it's cube cut, it's hard to keep it lit. But when you just slice it, it burns very well and it's delicious. Though it is pretty strong. I agree, Dimitri. It is a good tobacco. But I, did, I started smoking on recommendation from these guys here. I'm smoking... H.H. Rustica in my Peterson Dracula. There's a strong one for you. It's still, I, I laid a few tins by on that Rustica and I just, I still, it's so yummy. If you haven't tried it. Oh, I have a, speaking of Rustica, um, I was going to do a little um, live stream on this. I, I don't know if any of you have seen this, but uh, I got a uh, hold of a recent article about some biologists who were actually studying um, how, how to uh, analyze vegetation from sort of very small samples. There's a, there's a fancy word for this that I, I can't remember, uh, but they were actually bringing out um, residues from Native American pipes that they had um, on in their in their museum, some that were pre-Columbian and some that were, you know, uh, post-Columbian. And um, they talked about 
uh, what was relevant was that um, the pre-Columbian pipes had no had no residue of rustica. It had this other varietal um, plus um, a variety of sumac, which if you guys don't know, is like poison oak or it's, it's in that family. But apparently they used to, Native Americans used to mix sumac with their tobacco quite a bit to um, create their blends. The rustica appeared after uh, colonization. And so the theory that they came up, and I just, just don't shoot the messenger, was that rustica was imported into the North America from South America by European traders. Yeah, that's very plausible because uh, Nicotiana rustica is very popular in South America, especially like Peru. Uh, it's known there as mopacho. They still uh, grow it, they still smoke it. And uh, uh, also it became very popular in Southeast Asia, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, people smoke a lot of it there. Do they grow it in Southeast Asia too, or is it all? Uh, yes, yeah, they do. Well, uh, they even grow it in Russia, where it's known as Mahorka. <laughs> where they say they invented it. Sorry. Yeah, but all uh, uh, tobacco uh, originates in America, both South America and North America. I'm still waiting on um, our guest to arrive. Just, just to... Um, to share with you, and he'll probably share uh, this himself when he arrives. So Simon is uh, very orthodox in his religion and um, has, you know, family responsibilities during the, the Sabbath. And so he has to wait until the end of the day, he has to wait until the end of the, you know, when I was growing up, that meant like sundown. But apparently it's like sundown and moon down and kids to bed and everything. And then he has uh, the ability to uh, to come and join us. So he'll be here as soon as he can, he said. But um, um, ha Has anybody ever watched any of Simon's YouTube um, YouTube shows? No, this is actually since I discovered uh, Virtual Pipe Club. It's probably the first time I've looked at anything pipe worthy. Yeah about uh, on YouTube. So pretty much uh, you guys are introducing me to pipes on YouTube. So kudos. <laughs> He's well worth, uh, well worth um, uh, watching. And he has this amazing voice. Like um, he, I think is a voice double for Sean Bean. So <laughs> he, um, I'm going to try to get him to say during the, during the club meeting today, uh, you cannot simply walk into Mordor. Uh, I want to just, I just want to hear him say that. I just... <laughs> also on his uh, videos, David, he normally, you don't see his face on his YouTube videos. I don't know videos. if he's going to show his face today in our meeting. It'll be... <laughs> what, what was he, has he, he has great, great hands. hands. <laughs> he has great hands, yes. It's... Yeah. <laughs> Isn't he the one who made the, the comparison between Quiet Nights and... That's the one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He did a very and you know after I did my sort of comparison of Penzance and a couple others, I went back and watched it. I'm like, dude, he's right on. I totally agree with him. Like he was also. What was the name of his YouTube channel? Well, um, London, London Calling. London yeah. Calling. London Fine. Calling. Um, and he sort of rebranded himself a couple of times. So it used to be, you know. Bosco Piper UK and then the UK Piper and now LCS Briars, I think is his is his latest um, you know handle that he uh, that he uses. But yeah, I would go London Calling with Simon. Fabulous channel. He's he's taken us you know like um, we have our pipe club here. Uh, he's gone to the London Pipe Club a number of times with his camera and like just showed what what everybody. Um, there, it's very interesting. They just kind of sit and quietly smoke, and every once in a while, make a very English joke, <laughs> and, and that, <laughs> that's that's the exciting moment in the London pipe club. Yeah, and the English jokes normally in the London pipe club normally mean taking the mech out of the uh, well, the mechs. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm, I'm going to stay out of that. <laughs> Paddy Englishman, Paddy Irishman, and Paddy Scotsman. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mookfather678 says, he's a song and dance guy off of YouTube. Well, that's interesting comment. Mm. We will have to ask him about that. Briar Blues is visiting us over there on YouTube. Hey, it's very nice to see you. Um, kind of on something we were talking about a minute ago. Is there anybody that could tag me in the post about that uh, the pipe for the club? I can't find that post. I even went through announcements and I couldn't find it. We'll take care of you, Tyler. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Then after then after the first of the year, we'll all have to have one meeting where you're not allowed in without a club pipe. <laughs> I'll take my order this evening. <laughs> better, that's right. Steve, you better, order, better order now. That's gonna be like the Patreon uh, Patreon virtual club uh, meeting. That's right. That's right. You've, you've got to you got to do some kind of a, a, a um, pay your dues sort of thing. Very cool. Bud, what are you smoking today? And is that Actually, a bones that you've got there? That's the bones, yeah. Yep. It's kind of a sitter, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Big bowl, thick walls. I got what, what they call it. It's not a tulip, but it's something like that. Uh, I'm smoking some uh, of Storyteller's Pipes. Is a new blend, the uh, Cockeyed Kilt House Blend. Hmm. Where do you find uh, your um, your tobaccos? But do you do you have a, a particular um, online store that you go to, or you just you know I kind of bounce around. I kind of like uh, I kind of like the smaller like storytellers pipe is kind of a small house, and even uh, tobaccopipes.com is fair, that's a fairly small house, that kind of thing. And, uh, I tend to go more toward them because I think they need more of the business than somebody like a pipes and cigars or even smoking pipes, you know, main kind of thing. But yeah, they're all, you know what I mean? I, I got newsletters from all of them. So things on right. sale and everything else. So, but it, it's I, interesting. I order, he does a good job like of guys, describing. So I'm going to go look for what you just talked about. Cause that's, that's how I sort of decide, Hey, I should try some of that. I, I just listen to you guys and steal your ideas. Um, I, um, he has a, he's just started doing some house blends and the one I really love is a uh, sweet Galenas, which is a take on Hobbit week. And, uh, it's just, I think it's just awesome. So. Speaking of smaller houses, uh, Eddie Gray from the pipe nook is going to be one of our guest speakers, um, here in a couple of weeks, just right after, uh, right after Halloween. Actually, no, I take that back. He is our guest speaker next week. And he has something special because he's doing a special live stream on Halloween about uh, Matches 860. And so he's going to be, you know, doing a special um, um, acknowledgement about John and uh, talk about the special pipe and the special blends that he's got. So, so he's going to come. He's going to talk about, you know, the pipe nook, but also about his thing on Halloween. So. Um, that might be something also you guys might want to check out when he does that. Could I actually oh. ask a favor out of you knowledgeable people here with this new pipe I've just received and opened up? It has the stinger in it, which I have either just broken out of the stem <laughs> or uh, <laughs> uh, what do you do? You guys just take the stinger out of it and smoke it without it or uh, do you clean it after every smoke? Does it clog up with all the dirt the same way say a filter would or, or whatnot i've never i've never had a pipe that's come with one of these before now well i have few pipes with the stinger i keep them all in uh, as uh, they were made uh, they just need some extra cleaning so after pipe pulls down i uh, take the mouthpiece off and uh, wipe it uh, with a paper towel. Sometimes uh, put a little uh, alcohol or vodka on paper towel to get the tar off the stinger. But otherwise, just smoke it as any other pipe. 
Uh, might fire up a bowl of dust now and see how it goes then. Sounds like an idea. Top for the tip. Yeah. It's one of those things I think, you know, like it, it ranges all over the map. Some, some people uh, like uh, Dimitri leaves it in. I took all of mine out because, just because I, I like a little bit of a freer draw, but that could just because I'm terrible at smoking a pipe it, that, you know, um, so I don't think it's going to, the, the pipe police are not going to descend from ropes in the ceiling. If you take the stinger out, let's put it that way. Yeah, basically just matter of personal preference. Sorry, I couldn't hear you there. It's just a matter of personal preference. Uh, try to smoke it with a stinger, try to smoke it without stinger and see uh, which way you like it better. Well, we'll give that a bash now and find out what the crack is. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, um, I uh, want to make one announcement for cigar smokers. Um, about one week ago, new cigar came out by Cigar Couch. Uh, it's called uh, Culture Blend Number no. Three, created by Adrian Acosta. Uh, Adrian used to work at Nat Sherman, and his father is actually tobacco supplier for Davidoff. So I had a chance to smoke that cigar like some five, four, five years ago when uh, Adrian was still working on it. It was still work in progress. And uh, I just bought the bundle. It's a bundle of 10 cigars, which sells $400. It's uh, limited production. And uh, uh, when they sold, it will be at least five years before uh, they'll be available again, just mm -hmm. because uh, they don't have enough uh, well-aged tobacco for that. So it will take at least another five years if they'll make it again. But it's amazing cigar. It's very well balanced, a lot of flavor, not very strong, but very flavorful and very complex. Uh, Dimitri, where, where can we go to find those? Uh, I think Neptune Cigars have it. Uh, some other online stores have it. Uh, you can just uh, search online uh, culture blend number three for sale and it should show you where they're available like ten dollars a stick i know it's not very cheap but it's incredible cigar sort of mid mid-range if you're a cigar lover i i get a bundle of cigars and it lasts me like two years so um now that I'm smoking pipes, whatever. Uh, Joseph Arago uh, over there on, on YouTube asked, how do you clean a stinger? So I just uh, wipe it with a paper towel. So let pipe cool uh, first, then take a uh, mouthpiece out and just wipe it with a paper towel and uh, if uh, the opening is big enough, run a uh, pipe cleaner through. Use a thinner pipe cleaner for that. But it doesn't need like any special tools or anything. Uh, Moogfather678 says, here's how you clean a stinger. Uh, very carefully, um, take a pair of pliers and gently remove the stinger from the mouthpiece and toss it in the bin. That was this recommendation for i i like uh, i've got a couple of k woodies that were real old ones i got them for like five bucks at a garage sale and they have stingers and they're metal on metal screws say so they screw in and they uh, they're really great for smoking wet tobacco the uh the stinger really does i don't know block the moisture trap the moisture nicely I wouldn't do it for everything, but they're sort of a nice departure. From I, might, the... I might follow your advice, actually, then, and use this as uh, the aromatic pipe, uh, just for the sheer fact that all my other pipes have the 9 millimeter uh, carbon filter option if you wanted to put them in it, but I always find that takes so much of the taste out of it. But this might be an option, then, to uh, lessen the moisture and keep a wee bit of the taste, as you're saying, then, perhaps. Worth, worth a shot. I don't think go ahead. 
I don't think I could remove the stingers without destroying the pipes. These happen to be like really integrated into the, the on makeup the of the pipes. On, on the, yeah. On the Woody's, yeah. And they're old. They must be 50, at least 60, 70 years old, probably. They're nice smokers for five bucks, especially. Thanks yeah, for listening. This is the first uh, Surrender Monkey pipe. I, oh, sorry, not meant to say that. Uh, this is the first French pipe that I've bought uh, ever. It's always been uh, American, English, uh, and whatever else. But it's going to be something uh, different. I feel like I'm being a bit of a traitor to Peterson's, but, you know, the last one of those I got has been a little bit uh, of a... It's like sucking a golf ball through a garden hose to get a draw out of it. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's why I think I always remove the stingers. Um, they, um, I, I feel the same way. But um, again, it's probably just because I don't do it right. Um, Peter, I got a uh, state pipe too, and it had the same thing. It had, but it had the bulb cut off. You know, the bulb at the end of the stinger it had it. It was cut off, so the screw part was still there. But the other, oh, that's. That's one way oh. to take care of it. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> kind of an irreversible uh, approach there. Yeah, you better hope it works, right? Yeah, exactly. I was watching um, um, Dennis, um, and I hadn't had a chance to, to say hello, but Dennis, you look like you've got a very um, formidable pipe today. Yeah, your mic's not working, unfortunately, but I can see it. Yeah. Not yet. Not yet. Might be your um, your headset. Um. All right, let's try it now. There we go. Now I can hear you. Yeah. Dumbass here forgot to turn his volume up. <laughs> <laughs> my wife would argue that I never have my volume down, but that's another story. Anyway, this is a uh, uh, Cobbett collection thing from Missouri Meerschaum. They run around, what, 20, 25 bucks a piece. And it's an acrylic stem. And it's not a bad little one. I got most of them. They got the little one, one, one small in this, and a one called the Wizard that's huge. I got it sitting over here. But it's a, just a simple, nice pipe. And it ain't that expensive. Speaking of pipes and expensive, what group... Are you guys talking about this having a club pipe? The old pipe smokers or what club? Us. Us. <laughs> okay, where? What's the name? Old pipe smokers? What's the name of the group? So the virtual pipe club. Okay. So that's um, what I did. I gotta put that up then. All right. Yeah. When um if you come to our Facebook page, uh Facebook group page, um we had Chris Morgan as a guest speaker here. Um yes. he might even drop in because he's been doing that uh, lately which is um, which is awesome i love it when he when he drops in um but he just he's he offered to create a special um pipe from his from his uh, one of his um his stock that he had plenty of and he gave us a couple of different options and and oliver um organized the the um polling about which design that we wanted to start off with and Oliver so he's going to stamp it with our name on it is that correct that's, that's correct. it's going to say virtual pipe club and it'll be oh, okay it'll be a bones a Morgan bones that is um that is a paneled Canadian and I'd love it a panel love it yes thank you Okay, we're getting picky here. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have both Lovitz and Canadians. I know what you mean. One circular versus oval and all the other stuff. But gee whiz, guys, come on. <laughs> Just call it a short Canadian. Bingo. In the interest of accuracy, you know, I'm willing to go with that, yeah. <laughs> it's still the same family. <laughs> Briar Blues uh, recommends going back to the um, topic of the stingers and the K Woodies. He said, for the K Woodies, you can only cut the stinger off, but you have to leave the threaded section. 
So I guess that's the only way that the the stem connects to the to the mortise there. So um, if you've got a K Woody and it's like a golf ball through a garden hose, as Stephen puts it, just cut the bulb off because you cut everything else off. Um, well, just stick a straw in it. <laughs> yeah. There you go. I was gonna. I was gonna try to come up with some kind of a joke about that, but it, it was turning awfully blue in my head there. So I decided just to, you know, just. <laughs> yeah. My objection to a stinger well, for a long time was the fact that I, I got a lot of saliva, and so I send a lot down through a pipe, and I could never get a pipe cleaner through a stinger. So that's why I almost always pulled a stinger out. But I've heard guys who say they like them, so I probably the next time I see one with a stinger. I might just leave it in to see if it helps. Well, I've got about uh, 20 of them just sitting around in my workshop. I'll send you a bunch if you want. <laughs> you can just put them in. I've already got 100 plus. I don't need any more. <laughs> I feel so much better about having multi-pipe syndrome now I hear you have 100 plus, actually. <laughs> That's why I'm in a man cave and my wife doesn't come in and she doesn't see them all. Otherwise, I'd be a deep doo-doo. <laughs> I am in a man cave and single, funny enough. <laughs> what can I say? One requirement that when we moved to this new house about a year ago was that she got her walk-in shower and I got my 9 by 13 room attached to the garage that I could do anything I wanted with. So my ham radio gear, my stereo gear, and my pipes and my cigars are all here. Because your wee room there looks like it's fairly well kitted out. Actually, it even looks sort of slightly uh, soundproof because of the color of the wall behind you. Is, I thought you might have had a wee bit of uh, of decor or something in there than I. Oh, well, it, it's, it's, oh, hang on a minute. It's got a lot of J-U-N-Q-U-E around here. Stereo <laughs> gear, some pipes, more pipes, and then amateur radio gear all over the place, which I still got to get. I'll tell you, I've been spending the last week trying to put an eight-foot ground rod in the ground, and little old me is having fun. I've got it down. i got about four feet to go. i got to keep pounding it in. And, and you gentlemen will notice that um, uh, um, Dennis is starting a new fad where he only smokes when he's on his elliptical. <laughs> Bull. <laughs> It is my wife hey, look, looking out too. <laughs> that 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 comes in handy. I've just gone through heart surgery, two blood clots in this past year, and so this moving was fun. So now I'm trying to recuperate again. So yeah, that elliptical comes in handy. The, one of the ladies I worked with before I retired sold that to me for two hundred bucks. So yeah, Ooh. I grabbed it. Yes. Now we want to see the reports that you're actually using it. There. That's oh, a very I nice. <laughs> oh no 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 i am starting to use it again because it's the only thing that keeps me moving especially in winter time so when i'm done at night i get on that thing until my knees kill me and then i go back inside and take it easy for a while well i'm just i'm just taking the wind out of you that i, oh, think I know life not. sucks and then you die yeah i know i know <laughs> you or, try as I or as i tell my wife if at first you don't succeed try a little lower <laughs> I'll leave that one out. All right, I'm going to mute <laughs> before I get any worse here. I'm um, I'm just making sure I keep my eye on our email just to make sure that um, I get a message from from Simon that we uh, catch him. So while um, while we're oh we got another person coming in, um, while we're sort of hanging out waiting for that, should, you want to want me to tell you a little bit about our uh, guests that are coming uh, in the next few weeks? Sure. So as I said, next weekend the the twenty fourth we have Eddie Gray from um, the Pipe Nook, and then uh, we have Halloween, which I think will probably I don't know that that we have anybody available to come in as a guest speaker, but we could do the, um, the haunted pirate Dutch flying Dutchman squadron leader, ghost ship 
<laughs> day when we talk about Halloween tobaccos and Halloween pipes. Um, then uh, November 7th, we have Ernie Quintiliani from Watch City Cigars, who's going to come and talk about cigars and, and uh, premium tobacco. Uh, then on the 14th of November, we have Michael Parks, the, the pipe carver from Canada, the Canadian. If you guys remember when, um, when Brian Levine was here, the question came up about who would be a great pipe, you know, a um, younger pipe carver to invest in whose pipes will someday be collector's items. And he mentioned Michael Parks by name as a, one of the three or four that he recommends. So, and I had a chance to, to chat with him on Zoom and everything. Terrific guy. You guys are going to love him. Um, and then just today, I'm sending emails back and forth to see if we can lock them in on the 21st of November. We have uh, Shane Ireland and um, uh, Jeremy Reeves coming together, the dynamic duo from uh, Smoking Pipes and talk about all kinds of things. And, and we're trying to plan some, some surprises for that one. So that's who we've got booked so far. Um, but we have a number of other people who are sort of in the, in the waiting wing. So um, we've got uh, the guy from Aristocob coming and um, so we'll be able to celebrate um, like Dennis with the, um, with our cobs. And, uh, and so that's what I've got coming up so far. Busy, busy. Well, I felt like I well, he wasn't doing my job here. Uh, I, Oliver was doing all the heavy lifting uh, for the club. And so I felt guilty about that and got on the horn and see if we could get some people booked for it. Um, Hey, DDR, Weston Watson just said he's brand new. We should hear what he's up to. Hey, Weston. Introduce yourself, if you don't mind. Hey, guys. Name's Weston Watson. I'm down here in Florida. I've uh, been in the Facebook group for a long time. I'm uh, usually busy on Saturdays, but I was able to join in late here. So just uh, glad to be a part of it. Awesome. So two questions. First question is, what are you smoking today? Uh, I just, uh, picked up a bulk bag of Arango's, uh, Balkan Supreme. So I've really been into some Latakia heavy, Latakia heavier, uh, blends lately. And, um, just picked up this, uh, old estate Wally Frank. Um, it's hard to date these things, but I'm guessing 1980s. Nice. Nice. And then the second question is, have you ordered your, uh, virtual pipe club pipe club pipe yet? No, I just saw that uh, announcement, and I'm going to check it out for sure. I keep an eye on it. Yeah. <laughs> and another question. I'm way in Florida. Oh, a little town called Port Ritchie, uh, not far from Tampa. Yeah, I know it very well, yeah. Yeah. I know Central Florida, especially Tampa Bay area, very well. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah, welcome, man. It's good to have Good to have somebody there um, who's new. Um, got a, a few new people today. Oh, by the way, welcome, Dennis. He is a new member in our club. I saw it. Bravo. Welcome to the A team. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, you just turned your mic off again. <laughs> Should we tell him? No. So, yeah, Dennis, you, you put yourself on mute. Don't, don't let him talk until he goes like for 10 <laughs> minutes on the elliptic. <laughs> the old saying, go to, go to heaven and make a U turn. Uh, <laughs> No, no, I, I, can't, I, see, I, I got two mutes, one on the, on, the, on the computer and one on my microphone. And I make sure my big mouth doesn't get through to everybody. I've been hitting them both. So, but yeah, I just joined and I ordered a pipe. So thank you guys. Uh, I've got two Chris Morgans already and for the price, damn, they're good. And so at that point, I'm going to grab another one. I also love Lovats and uh, uh, Canadians. I got an old Savinelli here that's about eight inches long and I love it. So thank you. I thought it was a good choice for our first one. Um, but um, not to, um, to 
sort of uh, keep the people who are um, the the uh, Bent Rhodesian fans uh, out of the loop. We will be doing another one for sure. Um, we already, you know, talked about that, and and there was like it it, it was a very close call, just, just so that everybody knows between the Lovett and the Bent Rhodesian. So it was just slightly more people uh, wanted the to go for the love it this time around. So very definitely we'll, we'll be doing another round and, and we'll see if Chris still has the uh, Rhodesians available. I'm pretty sure he will, because that's a probably a, a shape that comes his way quite often. So but since you picked the love it, I love it. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad there's somebody else making these terrible jokes, but so it's not always just me. On a rating of zero to 10, that was what a negative eight. <laughs> <laughs> but appropriate for this group. Maybe well, you um, our guest speaker has arrived and um, I want to uh, take a moment to just welcome him and give a, the briefest of introductions to, um, to him. Um, I, I'm hoping that most of you have, have run across him at least on YouTube. Uh, he's also got a fabulous um, Instagram page where he puts up a lot of his, his stuff. And I, I'm not going to try to tell his whole story. I think he has the most wonderful voice on in the pipe community. Um, and so, uh, but also I just think he's, he's just terrifically fascinating. And so um, Simon, I'm glad to see that, that you made it. And Simon has, has graced us with a full upper body view today. So, yeah, <laughs> so, <there. laughs> so um, I'm going to just turn it over to uh, to him and uh, just welcome him. Now, Simon, the, the way that uh, you've been on here before, you know how this generally goes, but um, love to have you just tell your story to, to start with um, uh, sort of your your journey from an occasional smoker, a, a cigar lover, all the way through now, you're more or less um, uh, a more or less a semi full-time carver. And so that whole journey, if you want to just uh, tell us that story and then, then the guys will open it up to Q and a and whatever you want to do. So Simon, welcome to the virtual pipe club, but you got yourself on mute there. There we go. Okay. Is that coming through? Okay. It is perfect. Okay, cool. Well, good evening. Thank you very much for having me on. It's a, uh... A great honor. I appreciate it very much. Um, in terms of, of a little bit of a, a backstory, well, um, sorry, I should have prepared my pipe beforehand. Just give me half a second. Um, I'm smoking one of my own, appropriately, as you might think. It's a uh, A little apple, which I made not so long ago, and I'm smoking some Boswell's Northwoods, which is a, a very favorite blend of mine, certainly this time of year anyway. Um, so in terms of being a smoker, sorry. Sorry, I haven't had a pipe yet today, so just bear with me. We're a very laid back group here. No, no rushing at all. So in my teens, um, I was in a, a Jewish college around from around 16 and a half years old. Um, till about 20. Um, and I started smoking cigarettes, Marlboro Lights. Actually, Marlboro Lights were released for the first time whilst I was in college. So I started off with Marlboro Red. Proceeded to Marlboro Lights, smoked those for a couple of years, stopped cold turkey at around 21, something like that. In those days, you were allowed to smoke in public places. I remember I went to, I was on the way back from my brother's wedding. He got married in America. And um, I was around 21 years old, something like that. And I was on the escalator smoking a cigarette. I just bought 
a huge carton of, I think it was eight cartons, sorry, four or five cartons, so about a thousand cigarettes at the time. And uh, I'm on the escalators in Heathrow Airport, and I suddenly came over all faint. And um, I nearly toppled over down the escalator. I was holding a cigarette at the time, and I put it down to the cigarette. No real um, reason for it, but that's what I did. I stopped there and then. Um, those cigarettes stayed in my cupboard sealed for about two years, believe it or not. And eventually I gave them away. And as soon as I gave them away, I got a hankering for a cigarette straight after. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't, I didn't restart. And my wife certainly wasn't interested in me uh, smoking cigarettes. And in the ensuing maybe 20, 25, 30 years, the odd cigar here and there, I wasn't a smoker at all. At a wedding, if I was offered a cigar or something like that, but that was about it. And my first um, <clears throat> interaction with pipes was as a, an eight or a nine-year-old, something like that. My teacher in class used to smoke a pipe. I mean, I think back now, I am pretty damn sure that he smoked clan of all tobaccos. That was an, an over-the-counter tobacco in those days. Uh, in, here in the UK, I don't think you can call anything an over-the-counter tobacco um, because you expect OTC blends to be cheaper, but they're not. They're all exactly the same price here. It's pretty regulated. But I suppose OTC in terms of what's available generally in supermarkets as opposed to tobacconists, but Clan is still one of them. Um, so he used to smoke in class and he was a bit of a, an interesting character, uh, a bit eccentric. He used to use the pipe to distract you and then punish you for not paying attention. Uh, one of those old school types. And um, so that was my first really interaction. We used to have a home tutor that came to teach one of my older brothers and he smoked a pipe and he had this reek about him. And then later when I went to college, I was roomies with a, with a guy who was also quite eccentric. I'm not trying to say that all pipe people are eccentric. And um, he used to go around the thrift stores, the charity shops and things like that. He was my age. Um, at the time we were, what, uh, 17 or 18 years old. And one day he came home to the dorms with a pipe. Another time he came home with a church organ, believe it or not. God knows how he got it into the dormitory, but one of these that he had to pump the levers. He was one of those kind of guys. But then later on in life, uh, my family, um, generally as a rule, on Sundays we'd go out as a family. And um, many times it would take us to Covent Gardens. And there's a store there called Cigar and Snuff. And um, I used to push my nose against the window every time we went there. And I was always intrigued. Um, and just one day, I just went for it and picked up a pipe. I still have that pipe. Um, I actually rusticated it not so long ago, but it was zero. I'm not going to say the brand, but it wasn't a particularly good pipe. I bought the pipe. I bought a bit of uh, aromatic tobacco. I skulked off in a corner somewhere in Common Garden. I tried to light the thing. Obviously, I crammed it with tobacco as much as I could get in there, right? I mean, you obviously want it to be full. Couldn't get a draw, obviously. I knew absolutely zero about loading a pipe, obviously. Um, and just stood there frust frustrated, burning my tongue. And uh, it was a bit of a waste of exercise. But I persevered. I went online, obviously, and looked on YouTube. And uh, amongst many others, I discovered um, Jason Dagner and his father. And I really enjoyed his channel. At the time, it was a very um, educational channel, not intentionally, it was just him enjoying the hobby. He worked in, in a factory somewhere, and uh, it was just him really passionate, really engaging in the hobby, and it kind of really kindled a fire in me. And um, I very quickly just wanted to get part of, become part of the YTPC, engaged with people, exchanged packages and that kind of thing. Um, that was nearly five years ago. And um, right from the, from the off, I think I 
posted my first video on YouTube somewhere around December 2015, January 2016, that kind of time. And um, in my first video, I did appear in the video. I it was a full frontal, as you call it. Um, but for personal reasons, I took that video down and I started making more videos. And I decided that um, it was really just, I wanted what I was talking about to be the focus of the videos, whether it was a pipe or a tobacco or a cigar, whatever it was. And I just made a decision there and then to just leave it as it was. And since then, although that particular original reason, the catalyst for, for not appearing in the videos didn't exist anymore, um, I just left it that way and it became a signature of my channel. Um, and I was speaking with Chad Yardison the other day, um, did a video for him as well. And uh, we kind of uh, discussed the same kind of question. Um, and, and I think it's, it's very possible that people have gotten used to listening rather than watching on my channel. And I think it might be a shame to change that format. Um, in terms of pipe carving, I've said this many, many times, I think it is really an extension of my passion for the hobby. You know, I, I read as much as I can about pipe smoking. Um, I download as much as I can. And um, nowadays, if anybody asks me, you know, can I send you some tobacco? I politely decline but if somebody wants to send me a magazine i'll take it because i'm just i'm thirsty for that um written information you know whether it's books or magazines or i recently managed to get book one of the ephemeris um so i'd like to get book two i've already got somebody who's holding one for me so when uh, the time is right hopefully i'll get that so it's really about um just trying to imbibe absorb as much information as i can and pipe making was really just uh, an extension of that journey. I started off buying uh, a couple of kit blocks, as most people do, pre-drilled with a stem. Um, I took it on vacation with me once. Um, and I took with me, um, I think I had already started playing around. Um, but the first pipe, which I still actually have, that's the first pipe I, have, I ever carved, which needed some band-aids because it had a little boo-boo on the shank there. But um, it smoked, I have smoked it. Um, so that was the first one I did and I kind of got the bug. And um, I probably made quite a few, maybe 10 or 15 pipes using uh, kit blocks. And um, I think the first one, I don't know if I put it up for sale or if somebody asked if they could buy it, I don't recall. Um, but that first one sold, and it sold for an amount of money which really surprised me. I, I won't tell you the amount, but it surprised me because it was more than I was expecting. And it kind of went on from there. So in terms of progressing to buying a lathe, um, for me, that was a huge step. Um, and it kind of always intimidated me, um, getting a lathe. It looked too complicated to me. Um, although I've been sort of fairly handy around the house, I've never really been an expert in anything sort of woodwork wise. Um, so I went up to Mike Billington at Blake Marbrise. I asked him if I could uh, come up and spend some time in his uh, workshop and he graciously obliged. Um, so I went up there and he gave me my first ever interaction with a lathe. It was a not a very good experience. It was a very negative experience. I actually did a video of that. It's on my channel way back somewhere, a couple of years ago, probably. Um, So he gave me a chisel and he showed me how he does it, which I don't do that way, um, but everybody has their own way. He actually, is, I think the way he holds the chisel, like they have one chisel and then another one on top to kind of steady it. So they have the, the, the tool rest, another tool, and then which they hold in the left hand and the chisel in the right hand, the turning tool, whichever is their turning tool of choice. Um, and I noticed that um, Ian Walker does something similar. So it might be something to do with an English tradition there. I don't know. It's, something, it's the way they've learned. It's the way they were brought up making pipes in their, um, wherever it is they learned the trade. Um, but for me, I, um, anyway, that, that particular experience was, was not a good one. He, I've, my hands were vibrating all over the place. I was unsteady, but it was perfectly understandable given it was the first time I ever did anything like that. But what it did do for me was it broke that intimidation. It didn't 
it wasn't it wasn't complicated. It was something to get used to for sure. Um, there's something spinning at very high RPMs, which you've obviously got to be careful with. Um, but other than that, um, you know, making sure you don't have bits of briar flying in your face. But other than that, um, it kind of broke that uh, intimidation. I went out and ordered a, a, a lathe. I actually went out to Axminster Tools, which is a, a tool, a professional tool company about 50 miles away. So it was a good hour, an hour and a half drive. I spent the afternoon there. And they also um, showed me how to use the tools. And to this day, I employ the same te technique. And I use literally one tool. And um, although I bought um, the usual standard set of the various turning tools that you buy when you're buying a set, but I just use the parting tool. That's all I use. Um, and I very, very rarely use any of the other tools. Um, to make rings, yes, I do use, um, you know, standard rings on the pipe. Um, I use a different tool for that, but otherwise I use one tool. Um, in terms of pipe smoking, I had a big change uh, about two years ago. I started off as you do with aromatics, but I very quickly wanted to experience, after watching people like the Dagners and, and these kind of guys, I very much wanted to experience mature, what I considered to be real tobacco. Virginias, vapors, um, Latakia blends, mixtures. Um, and I very much wanted to enjoy something like a uh, Scottish mixture, McBarrett's Scottish mixture. I tried it and immediately called it McBite because literally, as I said on, on my other interview, after two or three draws, I would get tongue bites. And I discovered after that and that pretty much any Virginia Ford blend just gave me tongue bite. Um, I bought from uh, Smoking Pipes um, a set. There was like a, a special set of Frogmortons at the time where you could buy all of the Frogmortons in smaller tins. There was, I think it was 40 gram tins. And you could buy the whole set for, I don't know what it was, maybe 30 or $40. It was really very reasonable at the time. And I bought that set. I thought that would be an introduction into Latakia blends. Um, I opened the first tin. I think it was um, on the bayou, possibly. And as soon as I smelled that Latakia, I was disgusted by it, to be honest. I was repelled by that Latakia aroma. It was the first time I'd ever come across that kind of aroma. Um, so I set that aside. I even tried to get rid of it and, and nobody was interested. So I thought, mm, maybe this isn't such a good uh, tobacco after all. Um, but I did get back into it um, a few months down the road. And... I was hooked. Um, I absolutely adored um, Latakia blends. Um, I smoked a lot of special Latakia flake at the time. Uh, and then I got hooked on Northwoods. But I found, the interesting thing was that I found that I could smoke those and not get tongue bite, or at least not immediately. You know, if I'd smoked two or three bowls, I'd get bitten. But I didn't get tongue bite immediately with Latakia blends. I found them to be cooler to smoke. Um, I don't remember what the catalyst was, but I did at some point try a filtered pipe. Um, and when I did that, it just changed my world. Um, I could smoke anything, absolutely anything without any tongue bite at all. Yeah, sure. If I, if I smoked like a train or if I chugged it too quick, or if I was having too much, uh, too many pipes in one day, then yeah, I could still get a bit of discomfort, but not tongue bite as I knew it. And since then I haven't turned back. I haven't looked back. I, I smoke anything, anything pretty much besides for uh, heavy burly blends, which I just don't like from a flavor point of view. But uh, other than that, um, anything, anything goes. That is my story. That's all, folks. Fire away. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, that story. I think you have got a lot more that I'm going to try to dig out. Um, so we, we, we did exchange a little bit um, about, so outside of your pipe smoking, you're a photographer, yes? Hmm. 
Yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit about your work as a photographer and then what you've done with photography and your pipes. Um, well, as a photographer, I started out um, probably about 20 years ago. Um, I uh, was a, a real estate agent before then. And um, I had my own business, which I sold. And um, I started um, doing photography as a hobby, as most people do. Um, and I was actually involved in a, in a, is there, I'm getting a lot of feedback on my headset. Is there, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, we can yeah. fine. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> um, so I was involved in a school as a school governor for many, many years. And um, I used to take photos whilst I was there anyway. I used to take photos of uh, events that happened in the school. And it kind of went from there. I had a camera and then I thought, hmm, I have to do with getting a better, a better camera. I used to put all the photos in the press, the local press, just to raise the profile of the school. Um, and um, it kind of went from there. And I steadily upgraded my camera. And then somebody asked me to do an engagement or a bar mitzvah or something like that. And it kind of just grew and grew and grew. And eventually, let's say I sold my business. Um, and just went into photography, and I've been doing it ever since. Um, so the sort of the meat of it is, is obviously weddings in the Jewish community, um, and uh, but there's bar mitzvahs, engagements, there's press events, there's fundraisers. I don't do um, sort of scenic kind of photography landscape. I don't do much of that. I don't do still life or anything like that. Um, but uh, the only still life that I have dabbled with is, I guess, pipes recently. But uh, even that, I haven't really. Setting it up and doing it properly for me is, is it's kind of mixing two trades, which, which you might think makes a lot of sense. And it probably will in due course. Um, I've recently had a website made, which although it's not, uh, it's live, but it's just not updated. It's still in a test mode. Um, and you can see some of my pipes and some of my photography of them, but I haven't really knuckled down and focused on that side of things yet. Um, I'm right in the process of, of uh, remodeling my workshop. Um, it was down. It is down at the moment, completely dismantled. Um, and I'm waiting on a delivery on a new workbench. So once that happens, I'll get the work workshop back up and running, hopefully in about two weeks or so. Um, so in terms of photography, it's been pretty dead now during COVID. Very, very scant work about at the moment. So pipes have really been a savior for me in the last six months or so, uh, made a huge difference. Yeah, it's nice I mean, extreme. you had you had a Good bout time. with COVID yourself, didn't you? I did, yeah. Um, March, April, towards the end of March, April, I had it for about three, three and a half weeks. Um, I still have um, issues with my the lower part of my body in terms of just feeling very lethargic and my legs and muscles are tired pretty much all the time. But other than that, I'm, I'm pretty good. Um, but for three, for three weeks or so, I was just downstairs on the sofa for about three weeks, pretty much. Um, doing not much else. Well, I'm really glad to see you, your recovery has gone well. Thank you very much. Um, so in this time then, uh, when photography isn't keeping you busy, you've pretty much dedicated yourself to just working on carving. Is that right? Pretty much. I would say 50% of my time. I have other interests, but probably 50% of my time at least. So I would love to see if you've got some samples hanging around. Um, and by the mm, way, sure. fellas in the group here, uh, don't let me dominate the questions. <laughs> Pop in anytime you want to. Um, I keep going around to turn off the microphones only because of the background noises, but turn your mics back on the moment you have a question you want to ask Simon, okay? Um, so yeah. in terms of pipes, let me, let me just ask, answer that question first. This is one which just sold the other day. It's a, a little chubby bent apple with a little bit of a faded stain. I've been noticing how much you get some great grain in your work. You are just really able to find it or are you, you sacrificing um, to some god of pipes? So that we can, we can get the great green. 
I guess I must be doing something right. Um, <laughs> but but no, it's about. Um, I guess it's about. Obviously, I would say eighty percent of the of the blocks that I get are plateau blocks. So you're always going to have a decent chance of some decent grain. You have to be lucky that there's no flaws. But other than but with, um, you know, most of the plateau blocks, you're going to get an opportunity to have grain. What you do with that and how you maximize it is up to you. Um, so I do spend quite a bit of time trying to get the right locations to make the bowl and shank to get the best out of the grain. Um, I also, my, my, I've been developing my staining technique to, to get the best out of the stain as well. So many times, um, I do have some pipes here, just a sec. So to give you an example, this pipe here um, is a slightly forward canted billiard um, with a deep ring. But you can see there's like a band of darker staining around it. And you can see sort of bits of highlights there. I don't know how well this comes out, but it's basically, you got some nice cross grain. But the staining, I try to try to maximize. And even if there isn't a huge amount of, 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 of grain on it, but by the staining, I try to make your eye lead into that. that bit of great uh, grain. Um, here's a good example. Um, this is a, a sandblasted pot, the smooth rim. And if you see there, that's got like an antique style, like a vignette of dark grain, but it allows you to really hone in on that central bird's eye there. Um, I mean, I, I could show you pipes if you want. Uh, I've got probably about ten pipes here. If you're interested, I can show you them. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, let's you. let's see. Um, you're you have a really unique style, and I I'd love to see whatever you want to share with us. Okay. Um, so a, a lot of the a lot of the pipes that I make are variations on on apples and billiards. Um, this is a uh, one with a uh, like an egg almost. Let me just turn that screen off. Um, so nice. you can see that again, you know, just trying to make the best out of the grain that I was given. Slightly square um, shank, but What's, with soft edges. What is your price range? Um, I have at the moment. I've got two two prices. Um, I I grade my pipes with. I mean, obviously, bearing in mind that I'm very new to the game, um, but the I grade my pipes with one and two stars. Um, they're actually stars of David, which I had a stamp made up for that, as opposed to regular stars. Um, I just thought that was a nice touch. Um, so one stars are around 140, 145 pounds, and two stars around 185 plus, depending on the pipe. It could go up to, I suppose, theoretically, no maximum. But uh, I think the most I've ever charged for a pipe is 250 so far. Beautiful, beautiful. Nice. Wow. This is um this was kind of a, a bit of a prototype. It's a magnum a magnum sized pipe. Um, this was a pipe I made a while back, um, and I had two rubies. I actually inserted two rubies in the shank there, and I was thinking of making like a, a range of sort of pipes with using the stones to grade them, um, but I, I I didn't really proceed with that. Uh, it was it became too fussy to to get these mounted in a way which was attractive um, but that's a big chunky pipe got a, a nice fish there a bit of plateau on the top for someone that's been doing woodwork and wood turning for such a short amount of time uh, very well done on your efforts <laughs> Thank you very much. That's very kind of you to say. There's a, a little uh, sort of sea rock rustication type. A little, don't know what you'd call that, maybe a little poker. Just a nice pipe to run around with. That's my favorite so far. Is it? Okay, cool. Yeah, that's a nice one. I like that one. <laughs> this one's a bit of a, a weird one. Some fantastic grain on it. I 
I call I call this one the submarine. I was going to say yellow uh, submarine. I was going to say tugboat. <laughs> it was a good part. <laughs> another little apple really nice comfortable lightweight really bright contrasty rim there i like to play with the colors you know to just make them pop a little bit this is one of my favorite recent ones which i i'm kind of i keep eyeing it up and saying okay nobody's taking it i'm gonna keep it for myself it's got an amazing sandblast on it I don't, know if you, I don't know if you can pick this up well, but it's got a nice sandblast. You can still see the grain popping through, smooth rim. And I just like the way it's sort of kind of Castello-ish, you know how it fans out at the top there, at the junction. It's a, a lovely part, lightweight as well. I and mean, where do you do your sandblasting? Uh, the sandblasting is done by Larison Pipes. So you send them off to, to be done for you? Yeah. This is, uh, this is a pipe I actually made in combination with Ian Walker at Northern Briars. Um, not intentionally. Um, there's a, a really nice plateau. Some fantastic grain on this pipe. This is a horn uh, extension. Um, what happened with this pipe is I actually made an extension of palm wood. A palm wood, if it works out, it's stunning, but it splinters very easily. Um, and when I made the extension, it basically splintered to the extent that I couldn't sand it anymore. It was just too thin. So I had to take it off. And I tried various bits and pieces, but in the end, what was left of the briar was so short, I didn't want to take the risk of ruining the pipe because of the grain. It was just too good. Um, so I sent it off and he put a, a horn insert on it and made a stem. That is absolutely gorgeous. Well, fellas, um, if you've got any questions for Simon, um, just jump right in. You can turn your mics on yourself and, and um, just um, ask away. Yeah, I uh, wanted to jump back to the beginning there. Um, I have a couple hobby blocks on the way. I wanted to kind of get started. Obviously, I'm going to tinker around before I buy a lathe, but... Um, what kind of tools did you use and what was your initial setup for tooling? Um, you know, Can before I see you who's speaking somehow? Can I set this to see who's speaking? Yes. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to remove the spotlight. And then, Simon, um, are you on a laptop there? No, I'm on an iPhone. Okay, okay now I can see you. I can see you now. Okay. What you can do also is you can finger swipe across the screen, which will take you to different, we've got about 30 people in the, in the meeting today. So you can just okay. see a bunch of people. That have you, know. have you got it set to whoever's speaking though? Uh, that was me. I was the one who was okay, asking about cool. the tool. Okay. It's just nice to, to speak to somebody face to face, even though I don't let you guys do that on my videos, but never mind. Um, <laughs> um, okay. So when I first started right in the beginning, before I had a lead, um, I had my, um, I had a, a simple, um, what do you call it? I, I hear it's called Velcro, but a, a disc with a hoop, loop and hoop, whatever they call it, um, back so you could put the discs stuck to the, to the backing. And that was just, um, it had a small arbor, which was put into my regular drill. Um, I clamped the drill. I had a, um, a workbench with a, you know, the, the clamp workbench top. I just wedged it in between the top of the workbench. Um, and that was everything. My drill was my whole workshop. My drill had the sanding disc on it. I had my polishing mops on it. Um, and basically everything was on that. And if I had did some wire brushing, it was on that. So everything was on there. Um, and no bandsaw or anything like that. So when I started with a block, I was sanding from a full sized block. So you can imagine that took a long time to do it. Um, but that's how I started. And I made pipes that way for Um, I don't know, maybe three or four months, something like that. Um, and so all the kit blocks were made that way. 
So whenever I used that, it was definitely with kick blocks because I had thought of the idea of using a drill press to start drilling myself, but um, I just went with the with the lathe. But in terms of what I started with on the lathe, um, for me, one of the biggest challenges was learning how to load the block onto the lathe. I have done videos um, about this um, on my channel because it's one thing which I like to share because for me, it was the most challenging thing. And I'd imagine that anybody trying and learning would find the same issues. The, the, the most important thing you have to remember with the lathe, if, if I get boring, just let me know if it's too tedious. Um, but the most important thing with setting up a lathe is understanding that there's one central axis. Everything runs on that central axis. As long as you keep everything lined up with that axis, you should always be fine. Um, so the challenge for me was loading the block of Briar. So um, if you see some of the high graders, uh, when they that still use a lathe to turn it, a lot of them don't, but um, you'll find that they've already shaped the block um, to a very accurate shape, square shape, before it goes on the lathe in order to maintain those accurate axes. I don't do that so to the nth degree. I, I, I do shape it as much as I can on my sanding wheel. Um, but I, I don't go too crazy about it. Most of my lining up is done by eye. Um, and obviously the markings that I make on the pipe. Um, but I think that it's important to get jaws. Um, when you buy a, a chuck, you usually get, if you buy a kit, you'll get a couple of jaw sets to go with it. And a lot of pipe makers, I mean, I, I see people who have been making pipes for years, still using the original jaws, which are just um, a four-way circle, um, which you would use, for instance, if you were bowl turning. Um, and you would uh, turn a little extrusion on um, the bottom of your bowl, and you would then clamp it to your jaw set, which is a very basic jaw set, which is about maybe a centimeter deep. I was very nervous to load my, my block on those jaws with just a centimeter of bite. Um, I just, I was nervous about that. I didn't like the idea of it. It was also hard to line it up precisely. So one of the first things I invested in, in actual fact, the first pipe I ever made on the lathe, I already had that set up, which was I invested in a set of Vermont freehand jaws. Um, those are fairly economical. I think they're $70. They're very rudimentary and very straightforward. Um, they're not the best, you know, in the Rolls Royce. There are better ones out there, but I don't think you need more. Um, it just aids you to line things up. As long as you've got square sides or nearly square sides, or if they're not square on the block, at least you compensate when you load the block onto the chuck. Um, and that's um, and in terms of a tool, I use just one tool, as I said before, pretty much, um, which is the uh, parting tool. Um, but it's not the one which comes to a point. It's the one which comes to about, my one is about four mil, three or four mil wide at the tip. And that's all I use. Um, and it's gone from being about that long to about that long. Um, you know, obviously you have to keep sharpening it the whole time. Um, and that's, that's it. That's what I use. Um, in terms of uh, sanding, um, I still use my drill. I still use my drill. I've tried to get some motors organized, but it just hasn't worked out. And I suppose well, it just works, so I carry on doing it. But at some point, I will have to invest in some motors um, for to put together a proper professional sanding wheel. Um, but I still use a drill. Um, the only upgrade I've done to that is that, that I found online... Uh, um, a bench mount for the drill so that it's screwed to my table um, rather than being wedged in a vise. Um, and that's made a difference just in terms of reliability. But other than that, it's, it's just a cheapo drill, um, which uh, I think I paid about 20 or 30 pounds for. Um, and that was it. I have a question um, from, yeah. the, from the uh, YouTube group. Um, Joseph wants to um, know if you, if you think that your eye from being a photographer um, gives you a sense of, of um, what you see in the block before you start to uh, carve it. I think it helps to have a symmetrical eye. Uh, and I've always had that even before I became a photographer. Um, but I think it helps that I've been so passionate about pipe smoking because when I make a pipe, when I set out to make a pipe, I, I set out to make a pipe that I would be proud to have and proud to smoke. Um, and that's really where it all stems from is that every pipe that I make, it's why I don't, I have done a few commissions here and there, 
but I prefer not to. I prefer to, and that means that I don't sell some of the pipes. It's true, um, but uh, it really comes from a place of it's got to be something that I would be happy smoking, um, and that's why I make such a concentration on getting the best grain. Um, I like my pipes to be good-looking pipes. If I go to a pipe show or to a meetup, I want people to like what I'm smoking. Um, and I want to be happy with what I'm smoking. Um, but obviously, first and foremost, it's got to smoke. So it's got to be made well. It's got to be made right. You know, it's got to be drilled right. And the button's got to be comfortable. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much my philosophy. I've got to be happy with the pipe. And most of these of the pipes that I make are pipes which I've seen that I want to have, that I want to own, whether I can afford it or not is irrelevant. I just like the look of that pipe. Um, and I'll try to mimic it. This is, is, a, is a representation of a Everson pipe on any of the Eversons really, but mainly, I suppose, um, innovated by Lars and then copied by his daughter, Nana. Um, but um, it, it's, it's nothing like theirs in terms of, you know, uh, accuracy, but it's, I'm, I love this pipe. Mm -hmm. So if you want one, maybe I'll make one. <laughs> yeah. It's a great pipe. That. I, I, I think that there were a couple other people who wanted to jump in with some questions. Just, so just go ahead and hop in. I'm just reading the messages here. As a visual viewpoint from photography helped see if I have some, oh, right, okay. Um, hmm. I'm a poet and I didn't even know it. <laughs> I mean, you've been, um, you, or you were at one time uh, going out to the London Pipe Club um, on a fairly good basis and um, hanging out with those guys. Uh, I'm really curious about what that's like. Um, I think Ian says he's also a honorary member of London Pipe Where Club. Where is this? The London Pipe Club. And the Pipe Club of London, yeah. Okay, yeah, I've been, um, hey, Chad, how are you doing? Um, I've been, uh, Chad actually, I don't know if you've seen his channel, Yardism, um, I did a, an interview with him a few days ago, um, a fantastic channel, if you want somebody to actually open up your brain and, and pick your gray cells, watch his channel. Um, yeah, the, the Pipe Club of London, I joined it uh, maybe three or four years ago, very soon after I started smoking a pipe, to be honest. Um, and it's a great bunch of people, I love going there, I'm always looking forward to it whenever it's happening, I am able to go once a month. Um, they actually meet twice a month, but the second meeting is on a Saturday, which I can't do. Um, but I, I love going there. It's just a fantastic place. So they get some really fantastic uh, visitors as well. Um, we had Master de Paya there a couple of times, um, you know, selling pipes at really nice prices. Um, and he's made quite a few of the Pipe Club of London Pipe of the Year. The, the 50th anniversary one last year, or this year, was done by him, which had a, a gold ingot on it. Um, it's a beautiful pipe. If you want to see it, I can show it to you. Um, it's a very, very nice pipe. You want to see it? Yes, please. Yeah. I'm smoked so far. So it's got this little gold disc on it, uh, which says, which has the emblem of uh, the Pipe Club of London, silver band. It's kind of an oval with a faceted edge, smooth rim. It's a really nice pipe, but I haven't smoked it yet. And it's got engravings on it saying Pipe Club of London and the year, 50th anniversary and so on. I have another question over here from YouTube, WKR Piper in Cincinnati. It says, um, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, can you tell us where you source your briar and on average, how, what is its age? Um, the vast majority of my briar is uh, Mimo briar. Um, and the age of it is whatever their standard is. It's not aged. Um, I have a few blocks which are aged, which I got from Ian Walker when I first started in Northern Briars. Um, he gave me, he's got a whole cache of blocks from James Upshaw pipes. So he bought up, I think, a few thousand blocks when they went out of business. Um, 
so he was very kind enough and he sold me 20 blocks um, at the time. I've tried to get more from him, but he uh, doesn't seem keen. Um, so it's, it, the vast majority are Mimo uh, Briar blocks. And I think what you get from them is usually around 18 months to two years old, fully cured, boiled, and is ready to go. Um, I smoke them myself. I wouldn't if they weren't good. And this is one of those. Uh, this one here is uh, one I made. Um, this is also a Mimo block. Really nice pipe. Um, yeah. Bud reminds us, um, please be sure to let everybody know how we can go about inquiring, buying your pipes. Like where, mm. where is the best place for us to reach out to you? Well, um, all new pipes as they are made, uh, I do a short video on YouTube. So my channel is the best place to look. There'll be usually when there's a new pipe, there'll be a two, three minute video. So it won't take up much of your time showing a new pipe. Um, I also post pictures on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, my Instagram um, is smoky underscore sim. Um, smoky underscore sim. Yes, I am. I'll, ty I'll type it up. Which is basically Simon, Smokey Simon. Oh, there we go. There we go. I had thought about changing my uh, YouTube channel and Instagram and the Facebook and all that into LCS Briars, but I really didn't want it to to become all about selling the pipes. I wanted my channel to remain true to what it was originally, although it is populated with a lot of sale videos, but I still try to maintain as much interest. Um, the website address is lcsbriars at gmail.com. Not gmail, sorry. lcsbriars.com. lcsbriars. Um, but the website is live and it's up, but it's not updated. So what you're seeing there is just sample images. I will get there at some point. I just uh, haven't had the opportunity to do it yet. Um, and I, to be honest, most of my pipes sell fairly quickly once they're made. I do have some sitting around, but out of I'm up to about 215, something like that. And of that lot, I've got about a dozen, which I haven't sold. So I'm, I'm really happy with the way it's gone. I've been very fortunate. I had a good support from, from YouTube and from Instagram. And yeah, you know, I've got some guys who have bought more than 10 pipes from me. Um, and that's, that's very, very encouraging. It's very humbling as well that people value something that you're doing, you know? Have you been Oh, my, my cluster. Have you come to the States to come to any pipe shows out here? Mm -hmm. The last time I was in the States was about 30 years ago. Um, so, yeah, it's something which I do want to do. Um, uh, Chad asked me the same question. Uh, he asked me, who would I want to meet? And I said, never mind who, where would I want to go? Chicago pipe show. Uh, that's something which, not to sell pipes, I just want to experience the pipe show we have at one pipe show here in the uk which is the nottingham pipe show which hasn't taken place this year there's been an unofficial meetup but not a pipe show per se um i've been two years um and it's a great experience a great time but chicago pipe show is just another level um and it's just something i'd love to experience i'd like to meet some of the uh people that i read about all the time you know when i i read the pipe collector magazine religiously um i only just uh, signed up about a year ago, but I've actually read back to 2009. Um, and I, I don't know how far back they go, but I'd love to get the older ones as well. Um, but um, mm, I'd love to just meet as many people as I can, really, out there. I, I think we're all planning on going the next time the Chicago Pipe Show um, opens up. We're all going to come in with our official virtual pipe club leather jackets. <laughs> our, our and your, uh, on your Harleys, right? Yeah, that's right. We're all kind of right up on Harley's. Um, no, I, I would, we've talked about this a, a bit in the club, how, um, you know, we'd love to all 
uh, meet in person since we've we've all only met each other. There's a few obviously who live close to one another and who met in person and met at some of the shows, but I've never met anybody in person. I'm really looking forward to it. So mm. get you out here, man. Uh, that'd be that'd be very fun to come and hang out. Yeah, I'd love to. I've met a few people. I've had a couple of guys um, who've come been, who happen to have been here in the states, and they've asked if they could meet. And I've met I've met uh, Andrew Serigliano. I don't know if you've come across him um, on the YTPC, um, and he's a great guy. And I had a great time meeting with him. I've met uh, um, Kobe of the Shire, uh, Stephen Waters up here in, in Newcastle. I've met him, um, and every time I meet a guy from the YTPC or IGPC, whichever, but anybody in the pipe community. It's like meeting somebody that you've known all your life. You don't have that uh, sort of uncomfortable silence period, you know, when you meet somebody for the first time. You just go straight into it. What are you smoking? Oh, okay. I'm smoking this. How about you? Should we swap? You know? And you just get talking about your pipes and then you start putting the world to rights and speaking about politics and religion and everything else in the world. And is there a God? Such a <laughs> yeah, that'll be our subject on the Halloween edition. We'll go, we'll go right into... Uh in that route realm super um floor is open fellas walter how you doing pipe making machine i thought i made pipes fast walter's over there on uh youtube we have a quite a good you you've drawn in a, a lot of good folks over there on youtube today simon well, usually tonight I have my own uh, weekly live stream uh, on a Saturday night, um, uh, uh, UK time, usually about midnight, um, called London Calling. Um, I've been doing it for a couple of years now. Um, so that's a fairly regular uh, thing, which I've been doing, as I say. So, hi, Tom, one of my customers. <laughs> Ian says, is there a God? And what tobacco does he smoke? <laughs> Well, it seems he likes incense. So, she so shot that. from the Bible. Yeah. Awesome. Um, we are... So, here's a question that um, some of our um, younger members have asked in the past. I thought it might be really interesting to get your take on this. And that is, what is the future of pipe smoking as you see it. Where do you think pipe smoking and, and everything is going? Well, um, I was actually reading an interesting article today, um, which was written in 2009. Um, and it's interesting to see what has actually happened. So the topic of discussion was the validity of pipe distributors. Okay, so because with the advent of the internet and pipe selling, whether it be eBay, whether it be websites, smokingpipes.com, these kind of things where you're literally buying straight, no, no agent, um, or you're buying straight from a carver, from an artisan pipe maker, direct. So the, the question was asked, I think it was Rich Esserman who asked the question to, I won't mention the name of the distributor, but there's pretty well known few. Um, and he was asking the question, is there still a case for a pipe distributor. So in terms of the US, in order to get your hands on a, say, a Costello or a Dunhill, you have to have a distributor because when you're talking about uh, factory made pipes, or even if I'm sure Mike Briar Blues will pull me up on this, he won't call a Costello pipe a factory pipe, but I guess they're somewhere in between. Um, generally speaking, in order to get one of those in the States, you have to have a distributor to supply the shop that you're going to buy it from. It was interesting to see. I mean, he was a distributor, so he was making a case for his own survival, I guess. Um, but he was making the point of that if, um, if you do away with a distributor, you end up losing a lot of the paraphernalia that goes on around pipe smoking. So not just the pipes, but your tampers, your cases, um, lighters, and all of these things. If you don't have those items, which are generally provided by the distributors because you're not going to get a private artisan lighter maker, are you? You're going to have to go to a supplier. Um, so when you go into your B&M, if you're going to do away with the distributor and he's going to go out of business, 
all of those other things which go with pipe smoking are also going to go by the wayside. So you're going to end up actually killing the whole hobby because if you don't have somewhere to go to buy everything, that was his argument. I don't think that's actually borne out because um, pipe selling is still a huge business, not perhaps compared to toilet paper in COVID-19, but in, in, the, in the pipe world, um, it, it's, it's thriving. I think it's thriving. Um, can a, a pipe smoker, a pipe maker, a private artisan pipe maker make a living out of it? I think there's only the few right at the top who actually can do it full time and make a living from it. I think the rest of us are really just doing it as a sideline. Um, and for me, when I first started doing it, when I invested in, in the in the lathe, which was my main step into pipe making, um, I said at the time, you can go back and look at the videos, I said it at the time that I'm going to set up my workshop um, to have tools which are good quality, the best that I can afford at the time, but I'm not going to just go out and set up a whole workshop. I'm going to buy the tools as and when I need them, and that's it. And I bought everything in a, in a controlled and, and thought through fashion. And I would say that the value of my workshop, if I were to replace it brand new, um, you're talking about less than $2,000. Um, but it, it's, as I say, I use just one tool on the lathe, but that's pretty much it. Um, so for somebody like me, um, my original intention was to just extend my hobby and possibly have something to fall back on in retirement. That was the plan. And that's, you know, that still is uh, on course. Whether I turn over and, and, and go full time, I've got no idea. Um, I think it's unlikely. Um, but the future of pipe smoking, you know, there's businesses going out of, um, you know, there's b and going out of business, Nat Sherman. We just um, heard of another UK, EA Carries, just announced that they're closing down. You know, the Magic Inch pipe makers. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, they're closing down at the end of the year. So they've sent out a catalog, closing down catalog. So at the end of this year, they, they're officially going with it. I hope it doesn't happen, but that's what they're saying. Um, so somebody kind of was saying that maybe that's another nail in the coffin of pipe smoking. I, I don't see that. Um, I see that as just another victim of COVID-19. Um, although they say that the reason is that the, the restrictions, the cost, the tax, which yes, um, it definitely is. But I think it's, it's people have to adapt um, and I think personally that in the five years that I've been involved in pipe smoking, I've, I've seen a research, no, I wouldn't say a resurgence, um, but certainly an uptake in pipe smoking, certainly in younger people. Um, and uh, I think it's here to stay. I hope it is. Um, regardless of whether I'm making pipes or not, I think it's a great thing to do. I wouldn't, if my son was to ask me, should I start smoking a pipe? I'd probably still say no, um, but because smoke is smoke after all. Uh, if my son was to say to me, should I smoke a pipe or cigarettes? Then we all know the answer to that. Um, but I think there is a future. I think there is a future to pipe smoking. I think there's a future for distributors. I think there's a future for everybody. Um, we all try and do our best to support all the mediums. So I try and support, you know, my, our local um, tobacconist, GQ, tobacco, uh, GQ Tobaccos, for instance, is a UK-based website. I go to St. James's where the tobacconists that I know of, that's where they're located. Sadly, the Dunhill store, went by the wayside this year as well um, in March. But I hear that there's another um, a cigar company taking over those premises. So at least that's staying in the tobacco world and maybe they'll stock some pipes as well. Who knows? We'll see. Yeah, I just want to add about uh, pipe distributors. Well, distributors uh, give us opportunity to broaden our horizon, to see pipes, which otherwise we would never see outside of the pipe show. Pipe makers cannot travel all over the world and go to each uh, pipe shop and bring their pipes and pipe distributors give us uh, that opportunity. Uh, so Absolutely. Uh, I have no objection to buying pipes online, but when there is a chance, I prefer to see it firsthand to hold it in my hands before I buy it. And it wouldn't be possible without distributors. I, I would agree with that entirely. I think that as people become more and more experienced pipe smokers, the, the, the priorities for them change in, in their pipes that they want. When I first started uh, buying pipes, I wanted my pipes all to look as pretty as possible or as wacky as possible or as bent as possible, whatever it might be. I went through that whole process and I think most of us did when we started off. And now um, I'm fairly 
uh, I know what I want in most pipes, although I still buy a variety of, of pipes. But I think it's more about seeing the drill, seeing the button, feeling the button, and making sure that it's a pipe you're going to reach for. You know, you could buy a pipe online, and it's a gorgeous-looking pipe, and it may be even a famous maker that's made it. But when you smoke it and you find you're not enjoying the, the smoke, then you're not going to reach for it next time you want to light up, right? So it makes a difference. Um, that's, that is really what I was saying before about my pipes. When I make them, I want them to be the pipe you reach for. That, that's really what motivates me when I make my pipes. Um, so, and, and I've, I've thankfully got a lot of repeat customers. So to me, it means that I'm on the way anyway. But yes, I agree with you. There, there is room for everybody. Um, hopefully they can all stay in business. I always say that if there's a market, that there will be someone who starts a business to satisfy that market. And um, it's tougher, you know, especially if you're not operating a boutique business of some kind. So the, the large players may not find it, that it's uh, economical for them at their scale, but there's plenty of people smoking pipes and there's plenty of people uh, doing boutique blending. So um, somebody's gonna have to step up and-, and step out Yeah, um, yeah I, think, I think there's a lot of innovation in the market. I think there's a lot of innovation when it comes to making pipes. You see some of the artisan pipes the precision with which they, they make their pipes and the innovation in terms of um, whether it's the, the cap, the go depth, um, or the wood inserts, or these kind of things, um, they just do it in such a beautiful way. Um, as long as the pipes smoke well, then, you know, I think there's such a lot of art that goes into it. I actually did a video on Friday, I think it was one of my morning drives, and um, I just, I was talking about whether, at what point does it become art and at what point is it value for money? And I, I, the, the feeling that I have is that once you get past a certain price point, um, and that price point could be different for different people, but for me, I would say it's somewhere between 100 and 200 dollars or, or pounds. Um, I would say that once you get beyond that price point, the returns diminish in terms of intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. So you might have um, a value. There might be financial value because if you buy a bone lord pipe, you buy it for a thousand dollars and you can sell it for ten thousand dollars. There's intrinsic value there. But in terms of the structure of the pipe, the quality of how the pipe is made, yes, it will be a lot better. But in terms of re return of value as a pipe, um, I think it's limited. So the rest of it, it really becomes an art form. So you're buying a piece of art, an objet d'art. And if you buy a pipe for $1,000, I don't know if you're getting $1,000 more worth of um, internal uh, quality of the structure of the pipe compared to a $200 pipe. Um, but I think you're investing in art and it's an art that you have to like and enjoy. If you're buying it purely for investment to try and resell it, it may not be worth your while in your lifetime, maybe your children or grandchildren. Uh, it's very rare. I mean, you do have those occasions like with Bone Lord or with the Everson, but it's, it's rare. Um, you know, a Yes Chonovitz pipe is worth a lot of money nowadays, um, but those are few and far between. But the average pipe you spend 500 or $1,000 or something like that, um, it, it's got to be something that you appreciate for yourself as uh, something that will bring you pleasure. Um, but as it, if you think that you're going to get a thousand dollars worth more of quality workmanship in the finish, maybe yes, but in the smokeability, I don't think so. I, I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm really new to, to pipe making, but um, based on the pipes that I've smoked, um, I've got a, a downhill pipe, which I bought brand new retail um, for uh, about $500, uh, I hardly ever smoke it. Hardly ever smoke it. Um, but um, I've got pipes which are, um, I don't know, any any of these really, but uh, I've got, I'm just trying to find a pipe which is like $50 or something. Yeah. So this this is a, a paneled Escorty, which I bought on eBay as, a, as a, uh, an estate pipe. And uh, it smokes fantastically well. I think I spent about 50 or $60 on it or something like that. Cleaned it up a little bit and it serves me brilliantly well. Can we talk yeah, a little bit really about... Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Dimitri, go ahead. Yeah, uh, you can buy a Rossi pipe for $100. So you can buy a uh, 7L autograph for $500 and smoking quality will be about the same. 
but grain, uh, attention to details, uh, visual appeal, that's uh, what makes difference and that's why price is so different. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that you get to a point where that's really about art and not necessarily about smokeability. Uh, you're paying extra for that finesse and that beauty. Yes, 100%. But do you need that in order to have a good smoke? No. You could buy a Rossi for 40 or $50 and have a great smoke. Yeah, like uh, one of my favorite pipes, unfinished Savinelli, which I bought back in 1990s for $30. I wouldn't trade it for $300 pipes because it's so comfortable, it fits me so well, and it smokes great. <laughs> I agree with you 100%. Simon, can we talk a little bit about um, tobaccos and blends? Uh, you've done a fair amount of, of review videos on your channel and, um, uh, and, and been about a bit. I, I remember when... Um, been about a bit, and I. <laughs> yeah. to uh to pick up some some different tobaccos from some different places let's talk about your your favorites your discoveries your disappointments um, you're, yeah, i keep putting I on you, brother just just so you know because your coat's making a lot of noise but um that's not personal <laughs> Um, a lot of, uh, I don't think I've really ever had a very poor smoke. Um, I've had folks, uh, pipes, which I just, uh, tobaccos, which I just don't particularly like the taste of. But I can't say that I've really ever had a very bad smoke. The only one which comes to mind uh, was Borkham Riff. Um, I think it was Borkham Riff whiskey, <laughs> um, which a lot of people like to hate, love to hate. Um, I bought that on vacation. I found I was out one day with the family and I found that I hadn't any tobacco with me. Um, I went into a tobacconist and that's all they had. I thought, all right, hiding to nothing. And that's exactly what I got, a hiding for nothing. Um, I smoked it for a, had a few drawers and then dumped it. And, and I think I threw away the packet. I don't know what it would be like if I smoked it now, because um, nowadays one of my favorite aromatics is uh, Blend 131 from Solani, which is a whiskey-based uh, tobacco. It's fantastic. I think I'm becoming an old codger. <laughs> you, you started talking a bit about um, your foray into Frogmorton and how mm. that sort of changed into your taste. So, so um, how do you, this is a perpetual question I ask, you know, or I'm curious about with everybody, is when you uh, go to your cellar, um, like if, if I was to go to a, a, a liquor cellar and or a wine cellar. I went, there's what I'm about to eat or what the, what the day has been like, something like that. How, how do you draw out of your tobacco cellar to fill a pipe on a day? That's, that's a very good question. Um, there's often days where I just have no idea what I want to smoke. Um, now in fall, autumn, winter, um, you, I'll generally gravitate towards a Latakia blend. Um, but so it's, I'm back on Northwoods now, but, um, or special Latakia flake by Jermaine's. Um, I did a video the other day on that. Um, and I just waxed lyrical about that blend. Um, so I don't smoke it every day because it's that good. I don't want to become bored of it. Um, and also it's a bit fussy to, to prepare. I find it a bit fussy to prepare. Well, you can just stuff your bowl fine, but I like to prepare it. So I know I'm going to get a good smoke. Um, and I find it takes a bit more time a bit more ritual on special out of flake. But on the days when, when I just don't know what to smoke, then often I'll fall back on my perennial a blend, which I mixed up London Fog, which I called it London Fog. Um, and that is um, Orlick Golden Sliced and Virginia Woods by McLellan's. Um, fantastic. Anytime smoke. Um, the, you get a great Virginia smoke from the Orlick and the Virginia Woods just brings a little bit of that magic from McLellan's. Not too heavy because um, you could smoke a um, you know if you want to have a great Virginia smoke you can always pick out one of those and uh, you know you're going to get a good smoke but you don't want to smoke it all day every day it's it's just too rich um, so a little bit of what's good together with something which is run of the mill like all the golden slice they're great anytime smoke um, and it just works for me whenever I'm not sure that's what I smoke. 
Um, that's a really good tobacco. All it golden sliced on its own is a great tobacco. It's it's underrated, I think. It's kind of OTC-ish, um, but you can't get it here in the UK anymore, which is a shame. Uh-huh. Um, we had so Tom Elton had... um, as our guest once, and he said that's all he smokes anymore. It's just Orlick. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Um, yeah, he called me up the other day and said, what should I smoke? I said, go for it. All it golden sliced. By the way, um, I think you are watching the, the YouTube channel, but Jeff Lockett from uh, Pipe Club of London says hello. Who, who, who? So Jeff Lockett. Hi, Jeff. How are you doing? Pipe Club of London. Cool. Oh, yeah. I, I have terrible trouble remembering names. I'm, I'm shocking that way. I'm 51 years old and my brain is at least 30 years ahead of me. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm terrible with remembering names. So Jeff, I've, I know I've sat next to you in the past and we've had good chats. I'm pretty sure. I think you told me about HU tobaccos once. Is that right? Is that you? You're being joined, joined right now by um, one of our members, Adam, who, or Aaron, sorry, who lives in Japan. Mm-hmm. Gets up wicked early in the morning. Actually, this is, this is probably um, a bit, uh, better for him because he usually has to get up like at four o'clock in the morning his time to join the pipe club so this is a little bit easier i think but uh welcome um aaron good to see you brother um we're going to be uh closing down in about two minutes so just so you know uh now that you're here we're uh, we're done uh sorry i missed you guys but yeah it's 6 30 in the morning here it's actually like woo-hoo, so i'm actually able it's light here for the first time for the virtual pipe meeting so how's the, uh, how's the uh, seasons going for you over there? Um, we're starting to get some fall colors here. Um, we've had a lot of rain recently, but um, looks like it's going to be a nice day today. Are you all done with harvest? Yeah, we're all done with the rice. So we're going to plow. Um, you kind of get like a second growth of the rice after you harvest. And so we're going to plow that under because it creates um, natural compost for next year's crop. So we'll be plowing probably in the next week or so. Well, it's good to see you. <laughs> likewise, see you likewise. Awake. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I slept. Yeah, I kind of it was a late night last night. So I was hoping to get up at five thirty, but it's the birds got me up at six thirty. So this was a, an un, un, unintended or unexpected um, a gift from Simon to uh, ask us to start a little bit later. And I, I think it's really interesting to see how many people uh, were able to join in today um, with a little bit later hour. Uh, so we might have to do this again. We'll, we'll take it. Um, Oliver, we'll have to do another poll on the, on the hours there. Super. Well, um, all tongue in cheek aside, um, Simon, what I typically do is around uh, the two hour mark or so, um, I start to shoo people out simply because I know that our families and, and spouses will, will, will start to be mad at us for not um, for taking up everybody's afternoon um, and then they won't let us back again. So um, I want to make sure everybody who's in the club today has had a chance to chat with Simon, say hello, even if you don't have a question. Um, but if you've got some questions, now's the time to bust them out, guys. And somebody did ask me for um, well. about somebody did ask me for about um, filters, whether mm-hmm. I use filters or not, and the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I use a filter in every pipe that I smoke, even if I buy pipes which are not filtered, I get them converted. Sometimes I convert them myself, sometimes I send them off. Um, but if, if you suffer from tongue bites, yes, you could uh, struggle with it, and and you know people say you're not smoking properly if you do get a tongue bite, and that may be true. Possibly, I don't know, but for me, I found a way to enjoy my pipes and not struggle, so that's what I do. Um, I don't think there's any right or wrong way to smoke a pipe. You smoke it how it works for you. Do you do you make your pipes to accommodate a filter? All of my pipes are made with 9 mil possibilities, and if somebody wants me to put a fil- uh, an adapter in, then I'll put an adapter in. And I can uh, put the adapter in so it's permanently fitted with the adapter, so it's down to 3 mil or 3.5 mil. Um, but they start their life as 9 mil pipes. Again, it stems from, go for it. 
I mean, I noticed you're uh, bundled up there with the scarf mm -hmm. and uh, coat and all that stuff for a guy yeah, who's uh, sitting out here at 90 degrees. <laughs> Is it kind of cool there? It's a lot cooler now. Um, I'm just protecting. I haven't got a coat on. I've just got a jumper on. Um, but I've got a scarf. I'm just protecting my throat. I have to say hell all the time. I have well followed it uh, general for quite a long time. I, I bore it. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, the labor is nice. Yerke's up in uh, Finland. Um, joins us really regularly. Yeah, and I, I, I follow the time on this channel every week. I've seen about it. He's the only few of the five uh, makes that uh, have shown or the whole process of the making life from beginning to the end uh, in one, uh, one life. Yeah, I've done. I've done uh, uh, quite a few. A lot of feedback there. I've done quite a few um, live videos, um, and Boris has been a, a great supporter of my channel. Thanks, Boris. Um, um, yeah, I've done quite a few. I'm the first ever pipe that I made on the lathe. I actually um, made with the help of somebody else. Um, it was actually a guy from America, I forget his name, um, but he, him and um, Pipe Nutter from Australia, Glenn, um, they both pretty much virtually held my hand through the whole process of making that first pipe. And um, it was an unbelievable experience. And from that's really where I learned how to make a pipe was they literally each step of the way, they guided me along on how to make that pipe. And all the processes that I make are founded on that first video, that first live session. Um, and obviously you develop, you improve and you, you innovate and you, you, know, you, you, you hone your skills, but it's all based on that first video. Um, so I'm forever grateful. I mean, where I am today is really because of them, it's thanks to them. I have a question for you, Simon. You ever made a pipe out of mortar? I have. Um, I've made about five so far. And the ones that I've made sold pretty quickly. They really look beautiful. Um, but there's always an issue with mortar in that you run the risk of them crumbling. Um, so I've had one back. Um, in actual fact, I've never had a, a briar pipe back, which is a nice thing to be able to say. Um, but I've had one mortar pipe back. Um, it was completely burnt out inside. Um, the thing with mortar is you can get a really dense block of mortar and you can get a very lightweight block of mortar. Now you'd think that the lightweight is fantastic. I'm going to have a featherweight pipe and that's great. But what that means is actually with mortar is that there's so much air in there and it's, it's just not dense enough. So when you, if you don't break it in properly, um, and even if you do, sometimes it's so lightweight, there's so much air in there. There's so much air between the grain that the grain, just the structure of the grain isn't dense enough to stand up to the heat. So this one came back and it was literally ash inside. Um, so not my fault in any way, but a customer was unhappy. He got a pipe which he couldn't smoke. So I repaired the pipe, first of all. I put a, a really heavy uh, bowl coating in the pipe um, and it repaired it as best as I could. I made him another mortar pipe and I sent, that, I sent them both back to him. So he was very happy. Uh, but I haven't really done mortar pipes very much. And I've heard other pipe makers saying for the same reason, but they don't do it. If they do, then sometimes we'll make the mortar pipe and put a briar insert, um, a briar bowl, something like that. Uh, I'm not at that stage. Um, I'm really enjoying working with briar. Um, and for now, I've got plenty to do just sticking with briar. People have asked about Mearsham and these kind of things. I, I'm a believer in what you do, do it well and stick to it. And, uh, you know, I'm still really early on in my game. So I really want to hone my skills, develop it, I still got a long way to go in terms of um, learning how to do bands, um, you know, rings and that kind of thing. Um, so, and that I, I, I believe I'm going to have to invest at some point in a metal lathe or even a small machine lathe just to be able to do those precision uh, bits of work. But for now, you know, one of the, the way I try to overcome that with a bit of 
start of the in the style of the pipe and, and this this pipe that i've been smoking is a perfect example so this this area here i just made that as much of a sort of a smooth rounded beveled just to make it look like it's an insert or that kind of thing and just creates enough interest so that the pipe has balance it's got briar rustication and then briar again and it just looks like a whole pipe um so that's that's pretty much what i'm doing Well, I'm going to um, draw us to a close. I have a couple of things that I wanted to, to do um, right off the bat. So the first thing, uh, Simon, is to say how grateful uh, that we all are that you took some time to join us today. Um, My pleasure. Join super, super interesting story. And I love your pipes. I'm, gonna, I'm just saying I'm going to be uh, messaging you about that one little poker there because that was really cute. I love that. Um, and I want to make sure that you know that you're invited to, to join us anytime. We'd love to have you uh, come back and just hang out with us. And certainly, if you would be interested to come back and speak to us again as a, as a guest speaker again in the future. As long as we can line up the timing anytime, no problem. It's been a pleasure and I'm more than happy to do it again. Yeah, this worked out well with the timing and everything. Um, just for the group here before we sign off um, to remind you about the speakers that we have coming up. So next weekend, um, uh, Eddie Gray from the Pipe Nook is going to be our guest speaker. I don't have a speaker on Halloween, but I think that we, uh, if we don't have somebody who's, who really wants to come in on, on the 31st, we'll do the show, do the, the club meeting all around weird Halloweeny pipes and, and, and Halloween blends, um, even if ones that we that you make up yourself. So that'll be fun to talk about. We've got um, um, Ernie uh, from um, Watch City Cigars uh, coming up uh, in November, and also uh, Jeremy Reeves and um, and Shane Ireland coming back to uh, talk to us about their big anniversary at SmokingPipes.com. Um, Simon, I have one one request. I, I know what it is. You already know. I All right, know, I'm going to close I, my eyes just so I can hear this. I don't. I don't know the line. I'm sorry. What you have to say there's something. No. I'll say it in. I'll say it in cockney English. There's something dodgy going on in Mordor, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I um after I I, I caught the, the the tail end of your last video. And um, I saw you saying that there's just one thing that you want to hear from me. So I looked it up. I haven't actually watched the film, believe it or not. Don't shoot me. Um, I, but, um, I, uh, I looked it up and I had the sentence on my screen ready to read to you, but I haven't got it anymore. <laughs> so, uh, well, it's so very I, I knew... You just say, one does not simply walk into Mordor. One does not simply walk into Mordor. <laughs> I am complete now. I am, I am complete. Thank you so much. Hey, fellas, um, once again, you're the best part of my week. I really appreciate the opportunity to hang out with you guys. Um, I hope you have a wonderful day. Make sure you wash your hands, wear a mask, stay safe, and come back and see us next week. Love you guys. Before I go, before yes. I go, hello, hello. hello. Um, Please, I'm going live. I'm going live midnight. So if anybody's interested, so it's um, in an hour's time. Um, if anybody's interested, my channel is every Saturday. I'm live at midnight UK time. So, so that's time on YouTube you... at London Calling with Simon. With Simon. And um, please do go um, hang out with him. If you've got some extra time this, this, uh, this, this afternoon, this evening, and you're not done smoking, come and hang out with Simon. And uh, that goes for all of you guys over there on YouTube right now. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. The time bell is wrong. <laughs> so, well, thanks um, again. I really appreciate it. And I, uh, I, I'm, I'm seeing that in terms of subscribers, your, your channel is around a, a thousand subscribers. Uh, you really ought to be up in the, in the many thousands by uh, the quality of guests that you have and uh, the, the content that you've got. So I'll certainly be shouting out your channel and uh, I hope other people will too as well. It's, it's a, you do a great thing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, gentlemen, have a great week. I'll see you next Saturday. Sounds Thanks great. Much. Catch you on the Thank next you. one. Okay. Bye bye. Have a nice weekend. Good night from Romania. Good night from Romania. <laughs> from a cupboard. A 